Hello and welcome to Grace Lutheran Church Sermon Podcasts. On this podcast, you will hear the latest sermons taken from our weekly worship service. Our hope is that you will find joy and comfort in knowing the forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. King was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot, throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. This is the word of the Lord. Weddings take a lot of planning. This past June, our daughter Nicole got married. She did most of the preparations herself, the catering, the florist, the venue for the wedding and the reception. She decided the menu, the DJ, the photographer. She asked her college roommate who lives in Australia to be her maid of honor. And she asked her sister Daria to be her matron of honor. Most importantly, she made her guest list and sent out invitations to save the date. Later, she sent out a second invitation announcing the main event and to prepare to come. Included in her invites were friends and family from Guatemala, the U.S., as well as friends and co-workers from the East Coast and the West Coast. Close friends of hers came all the way from England just for the occasion. There was only one thing that worried Nicole that I would come dressed in sweatpants and a hoodie. (laughs) She said, Dad, you have to get a new suit. I said, new suit? You mean a suit. (laughs) I think she would have bought me one if I didn't get one. I got one. Although she didn't dress me, the colors I chose had to be approved. I did not wear a necktie, but a bolo. And my bolo had to be approved in clear inspection as well. Even my shoes later drew comments as pictures circulated. What's wrong with dress sketchers anyway? As RSVPs were returned, some friends regretfully replied they could not come. A few people did not reply at all, which saddened Nicole. But those who did come were treated to a great wedding, a great reception, and a great party. Of course, Nicole looked beautiful. Dressed in a traditional flowing white gown, it was the most beautiful I'd ever seen her. I then had to give her away, so they say give her away. But really, Becky and I offered her to a man who we know will love her, and a man whom she will love. Wedding and marriage imagery abounds in both the Old and the New Testament. The prophets, Jesus, and the apostles spoke of the intimate relationship between God and his people Israel in terms of a marriage. 
An unfortunate example of a marriage, however, comes from the prophet Hosea. God commanded Hosea to marry a prostitute and remain faithful to her. The prostitute, of course, was unfaithful and whored herself out to many men. Using this prophetic dramatization, God wanted to show his faithfulness to the marriage covenant he had made with Israel, even while his chosen bride, Israel, repeatedly whored herself out, worshiping the surrounding gods and cults while the people were in exile. Despite her spiritual promiscuity, God remained true to his covenant with Abraham, bringing salvation through Israel's seed to be born in our world, to suffer and die and be raised from the dead for our salvation. On the other hand, we find a most outstanding example of God's faithful fulfillment of his promises in which Jesus also uses wedding imagery, and that comes from the Gospel of John. In just two verses, John 14, 2 and 3, Jesus speaks of his relationship to those who follow him as a future marriage. Though the verses are familiar, you may have missed the imagery because it's shrouded in Middle Eastern custom and because the King James Version kind of misses the translation. The King James falsely translates mansions where should be rooms. The verse reads, in my father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and make ready a place for you, I will come again and take you to be with me, so that where I am, you may also be. In Middle Eastern culture, the groom always built a room onto his father's house, in which he then would go and get his bride and bring her home where the two would live. Jesus takes his church to be his bride and live in his father's house. That's the gist behind Jesus statement. When will that happen? The wedding feast will take place when Christ returns to take her to his kingdom he created for her. That's the backdrop of our parable today. Our parable is the last of a series about mercy and judgment. And Jesus tells this parable sometime between Palm Sunday and Good Friday. This parable not only summarizes Jesus' earthly ministry, but it also anticipates his upcoming resurrection from the dead. It focuses on the wedding feast of his second coming and a king who sends out invitations to that festal day. Every person listening to Jesus at the time of this parable is no doubt familiar with how wedding feasts and marriages take place. Like with my daughter Nicole, there were extensive and lavish preparations There was also a guest list of those who hopefully will save the date and then later attend. They will all wear nice clothes. The only difference from from the Middle Eastern culture in this wedding feast was that the clothes are provided. No sweatpants would be worn. (laughs) Clothing seems to be the underlying problem in this parable, as you will see. In the parable, invitations were sent out at two different times. The first one came through Jesus' ministry, which we have been seeing in the parables. Throughout his ministry, Jesus warned of a coming date of destruction and judgment and invited the people to be prepared, to be ready for the coming of God. He invited all who hungered and thirsted after righteousness to listen up, Open their ears, pay attention, heed the warning of judgment, be prepared and repent. He told parables so that the Jewish leaders would repent and believe. He told parables inviting those who were suffering to come and be healed. He told parables and taught all to come to him to have sins forgiven and be saved by God's act of sacrifice. Those who hungered and thirsted, found their salvation and righteousness in him. In effect, Jesus' parables were admonishments to save the date and be prepared for the last day. On the second part of the parable, the second invitation comes. 
anticipating Jesus' resurrection. The timeline jumps to the end of all time, and the second invitation has been set out inviting everyone to come to the banquet. With the first set of invitations sent during Christ's ministry, our scene now is the culmination of the marriage feast of the resurrected and triumphant Messiah. To be married to his bride, the church. That is, all those who have heard, all those who have been prepared, all those who have responded to the first invitation, hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And although some may have responded, RSVP, to the first invitation by Jesus, nobody attends the second invitation to the wedding feast. God's beloved whore, Israel, did not repent. Neither the people nor the leaders. They did not hunger and thirst for righteousness. This joyous feast of eternal bliss in which God himself would take his elect and chosen people home to live with him in paradise was not accepted. No RSVP was returned. True to the prophetic message of Hosea, God's chosen people really were spiritual whores. They followed their own lust for the world, wealth and wickedness, forgetting about God. They prided themselves in their entitlement to be chosen as the bride, but wanted nothing to do with the husband. They did not want to take his name, didn't want to live in his house or his kingdom, and Jesus calls them unworthy. They were not unworthy because they didn't do enough or weren't good enough or because they had wandered from God. They were unworthy because they did not hunger and thirst after righteousness and repentance. They did not repent of their sins and turn away from them. They enjoyed their life the way it was. Having been invited How could they refuse this final feast? Remember one of our first parables in Matthew, like the seed that was sown on rocky ground, some perhaps at first believed, but through life they lost interest, did not continue to follow. Many perhaps had their faith choked out by the trials and sorrows in life, choked out by these weeds they did not continue to seek God's mercy with forgiveness in their lives. The cares and personal goals in the world were much more important. And of course, like the Jewish leaders, many simply refused to repent and believe. All that food prepared for those who had hungered for this final marriage feast. All the wine ready for those who had thirsted. All this gone to waste? Was it to be thrown out now? What would you do? God calls in those who were not his people to be his people. Originally not on the guest list, guest list this feast is now open for all nations. The feast is prepared for you who have heard. You who are hungry and thirsty for salvation. You who will seek and follow the Lord throughout your life. Listen to the prophet Isaiah who writes in chapter 25. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people He will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. In the parable, God's chosen people, his bride did not hunger and thirst for him, neither did they seek his forgiveness. And this end times feast is now prepared for you who come to him for salvation. The Gentiles, those outcast from society, those not part of his chosen people, He chooses and calls to the unclean, to the demon-possessed, to the mentally ill, the lowlifes, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, and you. To feast and thirst forever. You now are invited to respond 
giving your broken lives to him for healing, giving your broken hearts to receive his love, bringing your broken spirits to receive new life. You who have ears, listen up and receive the Messiah as your Lord and groom. Will you enter the festal feast? Now regarding these clothes, you too have received the save the date invitation and believed and have followed Christ in your life. That's why you're here. The feast is yet to come. What will you wear? I'm comfortable in my sweats, but I can't wear such sweat-stained, soiled clothes to this wedding feast. After all, this is God, the king's banquet. What will you wear? Something from Nordstrom's or Men's Warehouse might make you look presentable and worthy. As you try on different outfits, you step back and look at yourself in the mirror. Become critical. No, this makes me look fat. I don't look good in blue. It doesn't flatter my flawed physique. No matter what you try on, you will always find a flaw. You wonder, is it the clothes or is it just me? Well, I have to tell you, it's not the clothes. It's you. Your clothes are not good enough because you aren't good enough for this feast. Your clothes just highlight how imperfect and sin-stained you are. What do you expect a flawed life to wear but flawed clothes? You can't scrub that stain out of your shirt or blouse just like you can't scrub it out of your life. Trying to go to the king's feast on your own, no clothes you choose or excuses you will use can get you in. No concealer can cover, no mascara can mask your misguided soul. You can't bind up your brokenness, fake your feebleness, or disguise your disastrous, sin-stained shortcoming. Nothing can make you look presentable. Even your clothes confess your sins. And that's the problem for the wedding crasher. The wedding crasher hears the invitation and comes. And although invited, the wedding crasher does not want the new clothes, does not want to repent. He or she is comfortable in the flawed clothes, living their flawed lives. The wedding crasher believes to be presentable and good enough to just go in on their own. He'll accept me as I am, just the way I am, stained clothes. No repentance here. The wedding crasher refuses the king's clean, stain-free clothes, so the wedding crasher is bound and gagged and thrown out. To help you understand the king's clothes, In this parable, Paul once again uses the wedding imagery in Ephesians 5 to talk about this festive union between you and Christ. In Paul's Greco-Roman world, women gathered to wash the bride, to clothe her and present her to her husband and would then take her to his father's house. Paul writes, Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy by cleansing her with the washing of the water by his word, so that he may present the church to himself as glorious, not having a stain or wrinkle or any such blemish, but holy and blameless. On that final feast day, who will wear Christ's wedding clothes? You will. You will be given his robe to wear. You will be dressed by him. You are invited to attend this wedding feast for you have been washed by his word in baptism. You have been shown mercy and forgiveness. You have been clothed with the eternal life of the resurrected Christ. And on that day, dressed in a triumphant robe of righteousness, you will be presented to him to be his bride, to live in his heavenly kingdom forever. Until then, you and I are to hunger and thirst for him, giving our lives in mercy, living our lives in mercy and love. Amen.
To know more about Jesus and our ministry at Grace Lutheran Church, please find us at www.gracealoneonline.org. You'll find additional sermon podcasts and your favorite podcast channel every week at www.gracealoneonline.org forward slash sermons.